Welcome and thank you for attending today's Atticus Advantage webinar, The Four Parasites Eating Away at Your Practice's Growth. Today's presentation is given to us by Steve Riley, an attorney and practice advisor with Atticus. If you're not familiar with Atticus, it was founded in 1989 to provide in-depth, ongoing support and accountability programs for attorneys and law firms that effectively help you increase your gross income, your personal revenue, uh, your, your reduce your stress and the number of hours you spend in the office, develop a greater career satisfaction, and allow more time for family and personal interests. Atticus provides programs, workshops, and webinars to help you streamline the management of your practice, increase revenue, reduce stress, and balance your professional and personal life. Today's presentation is given to us by Steve Riley. Steve helps attorneys grow their practices, and he has a way of helping you get unstuck and guide you through a process of self-discovery and major breakthroughs. He's a shareholder in Atticus, which is the largest practice management company working with solo and small law firm owners in the country. He's created the Practice Growth Program, the Dominate Your Market Program, and the Double, Re Double Your Revenue Workshop. Prior to joining Atticus, Steve built and sold his own law firm. Steve, thank you so much for presenting today's topic. It's a great one, and I think the attendees will get a lot out of it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome. This is one of my favorite presentations to teach. I get a really great, uh, great sense of satisfaction teaching this particular presentation. Uh, I have two goals out of this. Number one is to help you evaluate what's happening inside your practice today. So what you can figure out what's in inhibiting your growth and eating at the profits of your firm, what's taking money out of your pocket. Uh, a lot of lawyers are always looking for strategies to grow the top line, which makes perfect sense, grow revenue, but sometimes don't pay attention to the parasitic elements of their practice that are eating away their profitability. And two, uh, we would like to have you consider how we can support you with your management and revenue goals for your practice. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we're in the business of helping lawyers grow their business. So we're really here to help you think about how you can take your practice to the next level. Our agenda is straightforward. Um, first, we're going to talk a little bit about mindset around growth. We're going to talk about the four parasites. We're going to give you some key questions to ask yourself towards the end of the presentation. We're going to give you some access to free um, tools that we basically use with our clients and and helping select clients and improve profitability in their practice. And I'm going to give you some recommended action steps. So it's really uh, a pretty straightforward uh, webinar or workshop today. I hope you find it useful. So let's talk about this. <clears throat> when we start talking about these parasites, sometimes lawyers look at these parasites and they're like, eh, you know, that's really no big deal. And my experience has been working and coaching with lawyers and owning my own practice, and I, this is my 30th year of being an attorney. Uh, the parasites, while they look cute, tolerable, things that you can put up with, um, at the end of the day become really vicious, vicious, evil things that can make a terrible, terrible um, impact on your practice. It can make you go from really being excited about going into the office and taking care of your clients and doing what most lawyers want to do, which is just practice. Um, to just really dreading it. And my experience is once you attract a particular parasite, once you get this parasite, it really feeds on your practice from the inside. You know, think about a tick. You know, you get a tick and a dog gets a tick or, oh my God, human beings have gotten ticks, which, you know, carry Lyme disease. And while it's this little itty bitty creature, this little itty bitty parasite, the impact, the disease that this causes is systemic and terrible. And a lot of lawyers really look at these little parasites and they just ignore them. Like, that's ah, no big deal, it's no big deal, it's kind of cute, I can tolerate, I can put up with it. Meaning that your practice immune system's strong enough or you lack the courage to really confront what's going on. Um, either way, it turns into a terrifying thing and can be completely, utterly terrifying to really confront, look in the face of the fear of what you're dealing with, um, and really wrestle with it. For example, getting a negative employee, a really bad employee, well, they may be a good producer, someone that you're loyal uh, to, someone that's been loyal to you, um, but they're negative, and they might be a prima donna, and they are really sucking 
the life out of other your team members. And it, it, it is a um, something that really drags down the culture of your firm. And I've seen a lot of solo and small firm attorneys. I've seen managing partners put up with prima donnas that are really hurting the rest of the firm and causing cancer uh, among the other really all-star players. And we're putting up with this behavior because they're a good producer, they're a good performer. And it really impacts the culture of the firm. So when you're looking at these parasites, um, they're terrifying. I totally get it. I've confronted each one of these parasites myself in my own practice. We've helped thousands of lawyers <laughs> confront them in their, their practice as well. But I totally get it. While you're listening to this, you may like, oh, yeah, that's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. But when you look at it, at the end of the day, over time, it really, really hurts your practice hurts its profitability. So as we look at this, hopefully you're ready for some actual help. We're going to do everything I can during this webinar to give you some feedback. And at the end of the day, I just want to kind of set the foundation for this. Why are we talking about this? Like, why are we doing this? Look, you get up every morning, you sacrifice time from your family, you sacrifice your own health by not taking great care of yourself. You probably sacrifice evenings and weekends for the benefit of your clients. And what you're allowing to get between you and your client is a parasite, something that's actually draining the profitability from your practice. Now, if you had a leech on your body or a tapeworm or a tick or some horrible type of a parasite, a flea, a lice that's eating away, um, it's draining the blood from your body. It's infecting you. Some of these parasites are the same thing. By analogy, they're infecting the body of your practice. Instead of sucking blood, they're actually sucking cash. And what we see is that a lot of lawyers get used to the infestation. It's like a poor dog that has mange or has fleas. They just get used to it, and that's normal. And so they scratch it occasionally, but they're used to these little blood-sucking parasites draining cash from their practice. So as we look at this, I want you to really start asking yourself, you know, am I willing to take action to eliminate these parasites? Typically, these parasites are going to live in four predominant areas. And if there's one thing I want you to do out of today's call, in fact, what I'm going to do is ask one of my team members to call you to ask what your commitment is out of today's call. Um, I want you to at least make one decision to move forward to help you address one of these parasites. So when we look at growing a practice, your practice is built on the foundation of your legal skills. You went to college, you went to law school, you passed the bar, you've committed to developing your craft as being a better attorney. At the end of the day, most lawyers after five to 10 years of practice are about as good as they're gonna get on the legal side. Really to grow the top line, your gross revenue, or to grow the bottom line, it's not the improvement of your legal skills that matter. It's actually the improvement of your business skills. And these are probably the four critical business skills for growing your practice. First and foremost, your time and focus management. How you focus your time, how you think about your time, how you control your time has an incredible impact on the growth of your practice. Two, your client development and marketing. Your ability to bring high caliber clients in makes a significant impact to the growth of your firm. Building a great team. Now, when I say a great team, I don't mean a dependable team. I don't mean a plug and play team. I don't mean a team that shows up. I mean really people that are about what you're about. They're committed to your vision of their practice. They're committed to the mission of taking care of great clients or taking good, great care of your clients. And then at the end of the day, also cash flow and profitability, learning how to price your services, learning how to collect, learning what your profit per case should be, learning what your margins should be, and learning how to run a very, very profitable firm because a profitable firm can take care of a great team, support great clients, and improve your time. So all of these things work well together and they're based on the foundation of your legal skills. So as we look at this, as we look at this, those four parasites are the four parasites that we're talking about usually are going to be impacting one of those four business skills. Typically, they're not going to be impacting your legal skills, but it looks like it's impacting your legal skills because it's showing up in your cases. 
So these are typically some of the symptoms that we hear from solo and small firm attorneys. And if you're suffering from these symptoms, some of these parasites perhaps may be inside your practice. First and foremost, your income is stagnant, meaning that as you, over the past couple of years, your income has not increased or worse, it's shrinking. Um, a corollary to that is that the income that you're making isn't worth the work that you're doing, meaning that at this point in time in your career, you're like, well, you know, I'm so frustrated that if I could find something else to do, if I could write the next American great novel or the screenplay or win the lottery, I would get out of doing this. And if you start to start, you know, you start to feel the resentment towards your practice, if you feel like you're in an abusive relationship with your practice, it's a corollary of this income being stagnant or shrinking. If you're resenting your own practice and resenting your clients and resenting your staff, it's because some of these parasites are inside your practice. Two, your referrals are withering, meaning that you're not getting the same caliber or the type of referrals that you want. Your team is kind of like the walking dead. I usually say that the first level of employee that most lawyers hire is kind of the zombie. They move things slowly, they consume more and more, they consume the living, but they're really, really, really not doing a terrific job for you. And your day, your week, your month feels totally out of control. You don't feel like, you know, you don't feel like you have any control of your firm. You just feel like every day you go in the office and you're putting up fires. If you're doing this, your practice is sick. I mean, not just sick, but really sick. So let's walk through the parasites. And one of my favorite reasons to teach this presentation is because we're going to talk about the symptoms first, what these symptoms are showing up as inside your practice. So I'll walk through each of the symptoms, discuss the symptom, then I'll name the parasite, and then I'll give you recommendations to cure this particular parasite. Now, if you have a systemic infection where you have all four of these parasites going on, you're not going to knock out all four at once. You're going to have to figure out which one's causing you the greatest pain or costing you the most money. And if that's the case, go after that one first. So as we go through this and you're taking notes, which I recommend, you know, write down notes, um, you're going to rank which parasite is probably the most important one for you to address because in most practices, when we first start working with people, um, one or two of these parasites, if not all four of these parasites, can be inside a practice. Rarely do I see someone bring a practice to us for review or diagnostic work that it's in fantastic shape. I rarely do I see someone running a practice that well because most lawyers are committed to being great lawyers. They're not committed to being great business people. So consequently, their eyes are just focused on being better and better and better as a technical lawyer, you know, being a greater lawyer in the courtroom or drafting better trusts or, you know, representing their clients the best way they can. Consequently, some of the business elements and business skills are neglected and ignored. So those business the ignoring of those will show up in a variety of different ways inside a practice. So rarely do I see someone running a practice well legally and business-wise. Usually I see a lawyer just committed to running a practice from a, you know, just being a great lawyer as the best they can be, but completely neglecting everything from basic customer service, great pricing, good profitability, great benefits for their team, you know, recruiting and developing talent. Uh, most of those basic business skills are missing. So with that being said, let's go to work. Parasite number one, these are the symptoms. Small revenue per case. So we're looking at the, your firm and we start looking at your cases. And if we look at your past 10 cases or the past 20 cases you've worked on this month, and you look at the revenue that you're getting out of these cases, they may be small. And you're like going, you know, for the amount of work I'm putting in these cases, I'm making very little revenue per case. And how you do that is let's say you did 10 cases in the past month, you figure out your gross collections or, your, or what you collected when you settled them, depending on the type of practice, contingency or hourly or fixed price, whatever it may be, and divide those by your amount of cases. So if you have 10 cases coming in, you take the gross revenue from all 10, divide it, and that's your average revenue per case. 
So if I had a $5,000 case, a $3,000 case, a $20,000 case, a $1,000 case, you know, a $500 case, a $200 case, I'd put all those together that I brought in in the past month, um, divide those by 10 and give me my average revenue per case. In a healthy practice, one of the things that we look for from a diagnostic perspective is that the revenue per case is climbing up. Our profitability per case is climbing up. If a practice is unhealthy, the revenue per case is small or declining. So it's a measurement. It's like a doctor taking blood pressure or a doctor taking a temperature. It's a temperature gaze. It's a diagnostic tool. Uh, number two is if you are if you are dreading answering the phone or dreading answering email. If you're afraid of answering the phone, you hear the phone ringing, you cringe like, oh my God, who's it calling now? Or you have a lot of outstanding accounts receivables. If you have some outstanding accounts receivables and you're more, you've got more people that are beyond 30 days past due in, an, you know, in a firm that doesn't have evergreen retainers or that you bill hourly, you may have this parasite. And if you get very few client referrals where your clients aren't referring you a lot of work, as a rule of thumb, I'd like to see about half of your current referrals coming from existing clients, it's usually a sign of good client services, you know, good good customer service. So if you're looking at this and you're looking at going, man, you know, my revenue per case is small, if not declining. Oh, I hate looking at my email. I hate look answering the phone. I've got a lot of AR accounts receivable. Oh, a lot more than I like, that's for darn sure. And I'm not getting a lot of great client referrals What's the parasite? What's behind these symptoms? What is, it, what is it? Well, it's difficult to confront. I mean, I always joke that lawyers are lions in the courtrooms, but lambs in the office. So here's the confrontation. Here's how we have to look at this. You have what we call bad client-itis. Yep, bad client-itis. That means that if we look at this, your practice is being infected by bad clients. We don't have great clients. We have not done a great job of selecting or developing referral sources that send us great clients. And if we're not doing that, we're going to get bad clients. And bad clients kind of like are vampiric parasites. They suck the cash out of the firm. They suck the blood out of you. They suck the time out of your, conf out of your team. And if you don't think you have one, if you don't think you have one, at the end of this presentation, write yourself a note. Go out and ask your team or your assistant, your associate, your paralegal, whomever, or your spouse, hey, do we have any bad clients? Or better yet, if you can handle it, could you list off the top five bad clients we have and get ready? Because you're going to get educated from a whole new perspective. Most lawyers, when we first start working with them, have some terrible clients. They just don't want to confront or look at it because they're more interested in the cash flow. They're more interested in getting the work done. They have this delusion that the bad clients will sometimes miraculously become good clients, which is never the case. And at the end of the day, bad clients usually come from the second parasite. This is a parasite, bad clientitis. It's usually coming from parasite number two, and we'll explain that in a second. What's your cure? What is your cure? So Steve, I agree. I've got some bad clients. What's the cure? Well, it's like a leech, a leech on your body or a tick. The most important thing to do is to fire that bad client today. I don't care if they owe you money. More than likely, they're not going to pay you anyway. That's been my experience of bad clients. That's why they're bad clients. They're not paying you and they're not going to pay you. You know, they're just not. And I've learned this the tough way myself. Our coaches and practice advisors and clients will tell you that a bad client today will be a bad client tomorrow. And over time, they just become worse and worse and worse. You know, if you got bad clients, the best thing to do is recognize that they're bad clients. They're like leeches. Burn them off the body of your practice. Refer them out to someone that you don't like, you know, a competitor that you don't like. But just get them out of your life. Two, start to immune, immun, here I go, I can't pronounce it today. <coughs> Excuse me, immunize yourself. I was talking so fast, I couldn't say immunize. All right, I have to slow down. <clears throat> immunize your practice.
practice from these types of clients. And really the first way of doing that is starting to distinguish the difference between what a A plus client looks like, our case could be a case, versus a D client. So a client in this example would be a best client. These are people that you like to work with or profitable that your team likes to work with and refer your work. A D client or case is somebody that you don't like, isn't profitable, your staff doesn't like, and they're not gonna refer your work. And if they do, it's gonna be more like um, the kind of work that you're currently working with. One of the tools to do that, and I mentioned that earlier in today's presentation that will give you some tools, is what we call a client intake and evaluation matrix. So the intake and evaluation matrix is something that we work with a lot of our clients on, on how to work through what a great case looks like. Now, it depends on the type of practice you have. So if you're a personal injury practice, it may be one particular approach. If you're family law in this particular, you can see these from the screen. You can get a good sense of these. You can actually um, pause the presentation. You want to kind of look at these or screenshot them if you want. I don't care because we're offering them to you um, at no charge. You can have them. Or if you're in a unique practice area, I'm going to recommend that you go ahead and take a few minutes and put together this worksheet. Now, this is something we do in our group programs like the Practice Growth Program. Um, or when you work with one of the practice advisors, but generally we make you go through this exercise in your program so you start to distinguish what a great client looks like and what a bad client looks like and start to teach your team what a great client looks like and what a bad client looks like. Because over time, you'll be able to prevent yourself from taking these types of cases that become parasites, they become bad clientitis, and they wreak havoc on your firm. Now, most lawyers are afraid to do that until they've solved problem two, which we'll talk about in a second. So if you're interested and you want to have, um, you know, no charge for these, uh, copies of these or PDFs of these, there's two ways that you can get these. First and foremost, when my team calls you and asks some follow-up questions, which are pretty straightforward, the follow-up question is gonna be, First, what is the biggest parasite that you have and what are you going to do about it? Um, you can ask them, tell them what your practice area is and they can give you a client intake matrix. Um, or if you're impatient, you're like, I don't care if your team's gonna call me or not, Steve, that's not a big deal. Just email us at the following email address. And the email address is grow, G-R-O-W, at atticusadvantage.com dot com atticusadvantage.com so grow at atticusadvantage.com and say i'd really like to have a client intake evaluation matrix and if you have a specialty area say what the specialty area is and we'll have somebody on our client services team see if they can find you one tag to that if not we'll give you a, a um, model one that you can quite frankly fill out yourself and start uh, one for you to uh, learn about what a great client looks like and what a bad client looks like and this is important you may have a feeling what that looks like, but you really don't learn about it until you actually sit down and write it out and start to look at it and share it with your team and discuss it with your team. When you start to discuss it with your team, that's when the learning starts. That's when the eyes open and that's when everything shifts. So it's very important that you actually write it out, discuss it with your team, talk about it and then start developing um, a just say no policy to bad cases, BCD cases. And I understand in contingency fee practices, it's hard to do, but look, I did contingency fee work for 10 years. I tried cases, I did a lot of plaintiff's work. Most of the time, with the exception of coverage or some may, maybe medical issues, you know when it's a bad case. You've done enough cases, you know when they're bad. You know when the client's not truthful. <laughs> you know when you're suspicious about it. You, you know when it's a bad case most of the time. And when it's a bad case, get out of it. You know, get out of it. A slip and a fall with three pre-existing injuries and no coverage, <laughs> get out of it. Don't do it. Don't even think about it. You know, you, you don't even think about it. So you have to really start to develop some immunity and some conscious decision making as a good practitioner. And I don't mean legal technical practitioner. I mean as a good business owner, what type of great clients are allowed in and what type of bad clients are not allowed in. Otherwise, you're going to get the first parasite bad clientitis. Parasite number two, these are the symptoms. Unable to say no to bad cases because you need the cash flow. I need, Steve, you don't understand, I gotta make payroll tomorrow, I need cash. 
um, I'm taking this case because they got a check. I totally got it. I understand. Been there, done that, and unfortunately regret it. So you take bad cases for cash because you have this parasite. Two, you're focused on doing the work, meaning that all you do is do the work and you're not looking how to upgrade your client base. You're not looking how to upgrade your referrals. You're not taking any time to improve the practice. And number three, you're just too busy. Look, Steve, you have no idea. I am so busy, 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 busy. I have no time to market. And here's really the truth about it, okay? Here's the truth, it's terrifying, but most lawyers have this parasite. It's called scared of marketing-itis. Yep, scared of marketing-itis. And I've had this parasite myself where I'm totally, utterly terrified to go out and market and talk to people about what I do. Look, you don't have to be a used car salesman. You don't have to look like um, you know, a poorly trained professional. There's so many remarkable ways as a lawyer that you can market and develop business that is um, first and foremost ethical and completely authentic for who you are and how you are. We've taught thousands of lawyers how to do this. I get it. If you're terrified, it's normal. Everyone, every single lawyer that we've ever worked with from a referral-based marketing perspective or any form of marketing perspective is terrified. And typically, you're not getting better clients because you're not doing great referral-based marketing or any form of marketing. And referral-based marketing is probably the most um, how do I say it's the most no brainer form of marketing that you can do as a lawyer because it doesn't cost you anything. <laughs> it becomes like a great annuity over time. A great referral source will send you great work over time. Uh, I've made some terrific friendships with people that were initially referral sources that became great referral sources and great friends over the years. And, you know, most of the time, uh, what I discovered for myself and other lawyers that I've worked with and our, our, our companies work with is most of the time we're scared of this because we really don't know what to say, how to say it, when to say it, or how to do it. And so we have had no training. You know, when I was in law school, I took a course on trial advocacy. When I became out of law school, I took courses on trial advocacy. I, I joined justice associations. I joined trial lawyers associations. I joined, uh, you know, workshops on how to become a better trial lawyer. Not a single class did I take on how to get referred a fantastic case. Not a single one. And that's really, really sad because where the money's to made, not as a, in front of a jury, but in front of a jury with a great case. And I totally missed that day in law school, I think, or I think we all did actually. It's really how do you get great cases in the door? And if you don't know what to say, who to say to it, how to say it, and when to say it, you're not going to get the great cases. And that's just something you learn. It's a business skill. It's, you know, how do you go out there and do it? How do you go out there and develop it? And a lot of lawyers are afraid to do it because they're afraid to look like a salesperson. And that's myself. That's my primary fear when I was afraid of doing it. And once I learned how to do it, um, you know, it took a little bit of time for me to work up my courage, try to do it, develop some skills around it. And now I enjoy it. I enjoy it so much. I love teaching it because it is a fantastic business skill that allows you to be up head and shoulders above any of your competitors because they're terrified to do it. They're just scared to do it. So usually, usually um, this is a hidden skill that a lot of fantastic lawyers have that they've developed over the years that they don't tell other lawyers that they have because they don't need to, you know, the other lawyers are like, you don't understand, you know, I'm, I'm, I just do great legal work. Yes, I got it. You just do great legal work, but great legal work only looks like great legal work when you have a great case to work on. If you have a terrible case to work on, I don't care how good you are. You're not going to look great. You're going to look bad. And some of the best trial lawyers I know really became great trial lawyers because of great client selection. Some of the best corporate lawyers I know became great corporate attorneys, not because their just skills were incredible, but because they had great clients to dis, you know, to, to, to really show off those skills with. Some of the best estate planning and elder law lawyers I know are not just the best because their skills are, you know, incredible. It's also because their customer service, their marketing, their team skills are through the roof. Those are the people that really dominate the market. Those are the ones that become the best 
practitioners in the marketplace. And it's a business skill. It's just at the end of the day, it's a business skill. No different than learning how to go to a hearing, try a case, do a deposition, draft a trust. It's just a skill you need to learn to become better at growing your practice. And it's something they're not going to teach you in law school. Think about it. You're being taught by professors who are academics. At the end of the day, they're academics. They're employed by the university system. They're not business owners. That's why they became academics. They're trying to avoid any form of business relationships. That's how come um, some of your most successful lawyers out there um, may not be great at academics, may never were good at academics, but they understand the nature of business, which is about taking care of a customer, developing business relationships. And at the end of the day, quite frankly, these are just skills. Anyone, I promise you, anyone can learn them. Here's my cure, suggested cure. Let's start today. If you're getting, um, if you're unhappy with the types of clients you're getting, let's schedule at least one marketing activity per week and script a way of asking for a referral or an introduction that you feel first and foremost comfortable with, that is ethical and appropriate and authentic. And you can start with your friends and other lawyers, ask them for referrals in ways that you feel comfortable. There's a lot of different ways that you can start building up your referral base. But my suggestion is just like someone who wants to lose weight or get stronger, you have to start doing it weekly. And then once we get you up to weekly, we might get you up to three times a week, we might get you up to daily even. But to get started, just schedule one marketing activity per week. I really don't care what it is, but I just want you to start to do it so you can develop some muscle around it and comfortableness around it. And it'll start to make a difference, I promise. Over time, I promise it will make a huge difference for your practice. Parasite number three, symptoms. Constant interruptions, whether there be a text, email, your staff walking in, um, somebody knocking on your door, client calls, you know, you just feel like constantly interrupted. You have no time to think or really proactively plan a case or work a case because all you're doing all day is playing whack-a-mole. You're just swinging at things as they come in. Two, you're always feeling rushed or late. It's amazing how late lawyers run on appointments, whether those appointments are good things or bad things, but lawyers are typically chronically late. Three, you don't feel enough, like there's enough hours in a day. Four, you don't feel like your support team is supporting you. You feel like your support team is just not there for you. They're just not there. They're not understanding what you need and how you need it. Plus, your office is a wreck. For me, a healthy practice would be that your office is showroom ready. Now, what I mean by that is that everything is in its place, that you're able to walk in and work. There's nothing on your desk. There's nothing on your electronic box. You're not using your email inbox and Outlook as a to-do list. You've got your inbox at zero, um, and you're really focused on today's activities and planning strategically. Um, most lawyers are not. They're really in a reactive crisis mode. They're just playing whack-a-mole. They're swinging at whatever comes in the door as fast as they can, and their offices are a wreck. Most lawyers' offices are being used as a to-do list. They got stuff on the desk, they got stuff on the floor, they got stuff on the credenza, and all those are reminders. And those are not great ways of managing your practice. Those reminders suck your attention. There's a whole kinds of psychological studies that show how impactful it is to your brain and your anxiety, your amygdala, your prefrontal cortex, those core elements of your brain when you walk into a messy office. Plus, let's you know, plus, not only do we talk about you, but think about the example of setting for the rest of your firm, for your associate attorneys, for your partners, for your staff, for your receptionists. You're saying, look, having an office that looks like a bomb blew up in it is acceptable here. I've walked through law firms before where I'm like, it, it just looks terrible. And I'm hesitant to refer them work. I'm hesitant to do work for them. I'm hesitant to become a client of theirs because it looks like their practice is totally out of control. So this parasite is called lack of management-itis. It's just total lack of management. I mean, they're not running their practice well. Um, it is typically a practice that's out of control. And it's usually because the lawyer has no time or is taking no time to think and plan about how to run the practice more effectively.
If you have no plan and you're just running in place, you're kind of like that gerbil on a wheel. You're just going, 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 going. And you think the only strategy is to run faster, run harder, and run longer. And this is where most lawyers get in trouble. They get kind of this gerbil on the wheel experience where they think the only strategy is to work nights, weekends, work on vacations, not take any time off, and just work more and more and more. And it's because they're taking no time to actually manage and think through how to run their practice. My experience is that as your practice grows, your business skills must evolve to meet the growth of the practice. What do I mean by that? Well, it's usually three big phases that I see lawyers go through as leaders. Phase number one, they learn to manage themselves. At first they come in, they're kind of out of control, their office is out of control, their inbox is out of control. But most important thing that we like to do when we start to work with the lawyers, getting them to manage their own headspace, getting clear on what they need to focus on and get their, their own time management, their own to-dos, their own project management, their own case management under control. Once they do that, then they learn how to go to the next level, which is how to manage their team to do the same thing. So a lawyer typically can manage three to six people under them on a team. Sometimes a really charismatic and a lawyer with a lot of personality could perhaps manage 12 to 14 people directly part of their team, but that's a lot. Your average solo and small firm attorney is probably managing three people to six people because their span of management is about three to six. And that's typically where they grow their practice to, not is the three to six people. And they can't grow, grow beyond three to six, not because of the marketing, not because of the market, not because of the pricing. It's all because of their inability to manage more than three to six people or maybe six to eight people. Now, the real breakthrough, the market dominant players where they're running large practices and taking considerable time off really shift to a different level where they're actually leading their firms and they're managing managers who manage teams under them. So you can see this inside of firms where a lawyer figures out how to run their own self, like how to manage their self, manage their time, manage their focus. Then the next thing they learn how to do is manage their team. The next thing they learn how to do is manage profit centers inside the firm through managing other people. Now, I'm not saying you have to do that as a solo and small firm attorney. We've seen a lot of lawyers that are solo and small firm lawyers that you know maybe themselves and a, one additional partner maybe that have 150, you know, 300, 400, 50, 75, 85 employees because they've learned how to set up management structures inside their firm. And the management structure is the blind spot or the lack thereof is really where most lawyers um, don't think or can't think on how to run their firm effectively. So I'm not going to say more about that today. All I'm going to say is at the end of the day, to grow your practice is not more legal work that you need. It's actually how to develop your business skills so it supports the growth of your practice. Now, to my first recommendations, these are my suggested cures for helping you get control of lack of management-itis. First and foremost, go back to parasite number one, cure number one, say no to bad cases. Just get rid of them and don't let them in the door. There's just no way that you can work around, outthink and outplan and out um, litigate a bad case. You just can't do it. A bad case is a bad case. Call it what it is, say no to it. Two, over-volunteering. You know, a lot of lawyers think that volunteering for bar associations, committees, church boards, synagogue boards, um, you know, charity boards are great marketing. Most of the time it's not. It's really not. It's just calling it marketing. It's, you know, unfocused dithering, running around um, thinking that you're marketing, but you're not. You're really not. So a lot of lawyers get over volunteering confused with marketing. Uh, three, they get distractions, um, and they get distracted by stuff. So you have to learn to say no and get really focused on what's important to the growth of the practice. And sometimes lawyers will procrastinate very creatively because they don't want to um, confront the things that aren't working about their practice. I find them taking on massive research projects, taking on issues outside the practice that have nothing to do with 
uh, what they're actually focused on day to day. So it's interesting. I've watched really creative procrastination go down by some really, really brilliant lawyers because they're avoid of confronting a bad employee or avoid of, they're trying to avoid confronting that marketing or they're trying to avoid confronting a bad partner. And so they find other ways to focus their time and energy. So they have an excuse not to confront what they need to say no to. So strategy number one, to improve your practice, learn to say no. Two is plan time to plan. Uh, I would recommend that at least 30 minutes to an hour per week should be focused on planning. Uh, I would love to see two to three hours per week, but most practitioners don't have strong enough management structures, don't have strong enough team to support a three to five hour a week commitment to working on the practice versus in the practice. Um, and then I also would like to recommend that you have at least one day, maybe two days a quarter, where all you do is work on practice specific issues. Not cases, but things that will improve how your practice works. This is one of the reasons we design our group programs to be every 90 days. I'd like to have my lawyers every 90 days working on how to improve their practice, not how to um, be a better lawyer, but how to run their practice more effect effectively as business people so it helps their clients. You know, it really, at the end of the day, greater customer service, um, getting work done quickly, more effectively, creating greater experience for the clients. Um, increases referrals, increases profits. So if I can get a lawyer at least four to eight days a year to really improve their practice over a couple of years, it makes a significant difference. And then I recommend aiming for small improvements. You're not going to transform your practice overnight. These parasites have integrated their sucking cash and time and blood out of your practice. They're there. And once you start looking for them, you'll see them everywhere. And you can't get them all out at once, it's too painful. So you have to pick one at a time. You usually, and I'll give you a recommendation towards the end of the presentation, which one to work on, but you usually can only work on one at a time and get them out of there. Parasite number four, you're too busy to change anything. You're just gonna tell me, Steve, man, look, I'm just busy, busy, busy. Too, I don't have time for anything. I barely have enough time to come to get my stuff done. I got piles of work, stuff going on here, this going on here. Two is, you know, Steve, I want to think about this. I want to think about it. I just want to spend some time to think about it. And I'm not really sure if I'm buying into this parasite stuff. I think it's kind of some baloney, but, you know, it's kind of cute, but it's baloney. And I'm not buying in that I've got any parasites. In fact, I am the smartest lawyer I know. I'm a wickedly bright dude, and I am a brilliant lawyer, and I sincerely doubt any of these parasites exist in my practice. I got a dollar that says if you let your assistant or one of your partners or better yet your spouse listen to this presentation, they'll point them out for you pretty quickly. You just blind to them at this point in time. You just don't want to confront them. You don't want to see them. You don't want to address them. And you're just saying, nah, I'm a real smart dude. I got this figured out. I got a dollar that says you're not, and you're just ignoring it. Three, I'm going to read a business book. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the bookstore and read a business book. Now, why this is crazy is that 99% of the business books and self-improvement books aren't aimed at lawyers. They're aimed at other people. That, <laughs> they're aimed at other professions. They're aimed at manufacturing. They're aimed at other areas of the, of the business industry. Very few books are actually written and aimed at lawyers. In fact, my partners have written the best-selling book on time management for lawyers. You won't find it for sale at Barnes & Noble. You can find it on Amazon, but you're not going to sell it for sale at Barnes & Noble or one of the local bookstores. Because we're such a small market, there's only about a million lawyers in the country, and only about a half a million of them are in solo small firm spaces. So you're talking about a very, very small market. Um, and then sometimes I have lawyers say, well, I'll read an article in the Bar Journal. Yeah, good luck with that. How's that worked for you in the past? I'll call a friend to get their opinion about their practice. Oh, well, that's working really well, calling your friends to get their opinions about their practices. You know, you're pretty much, <laughs> the two of you are going to agree that, well, we have a problem. What are we going to do about it? I don't know. And that's basically what you'll agree to. So usually, um, you know, usually these are great things to make you feel like you're doing something, but you're really not doing something. It's like someone who wants to lose weight that's bought a book on dieting or went on the internet and read an article about dieting or talked to a friend about dieting. It won't matter until you actually take some action, like changing what you eat and exercising. Um, and Google or read what other people are saying on listservs. You know, 
that's just uh, you know a great place to go and get more information and discuss the stuff you want to do with others. You know, you had meetings, you had mastermind groups, you had coffee, um, but nothing really changed. You have a parasite that's called head in the sand itis. It's head in the sand itis. It is a wickedly popular parasite, especially among lawyers. We're an intellectually gifted group. Uh, we are in the 2% of the upper 2% of the population intellectually. Now, note I said intellectually, not financially. It's a big difference. Um, and we're academically really sharp. You know, we typically have, some of us have additional, um, after our JD, have additional degrees and certifications after that. We are overachievers academically. And thinking is something we love to do. But doing is not something we love to do. And thinking is the ultimate pleasure of a great procrastinator. You look like you're doing something, but you're really not. It is the master plan of procrastination. The more you think, the better you think you are. Um, and the more you think about stuff, the better you feel. But at the end of the day, you're actually doing nothing. Look, if you're following along with me, write this down. I have to keep this by my, I keep this in my journal. I have to remind myself of this. Thinking big at the end of the day is just thinking. Seriously, thinking big at the end of the day is just thinking. I would rather do a small improvement action daily for my business because I know that will win out over big thinking in the long run. If you're trying to grow your practice, thinking big's only good is if you're taking daily actions, if you're actually implementing. Thinking big is the ultimate level of putting your head in the sand and hoping it changes. It's not, it's not. You have to actually do something. You actually have to take some action. Once again, it's like joining the gym and hoping things that get, that, you know, helping things that will physically change for you as you drive by the gym. Thinking that you've joined the gym is one thing, but actually doing something in the gym is something completely different. I don't care if you go to the gym for five minutes a day, it's far better than joining the gym and doing nothing. That's really what I'm talking about here with your practice. I'd rather have you do 15 to 30 minutes or five minutes of work a day trying to improve some element in your practice than buying a book on practice management, putting it on your shelf and doing nothing. It, it is just, it's just a waste of money and time. You know, it just really is. And I see so many lawyers go, well, I took this great course on it. And I've studied it and I've done, you know, I took a, a CLE on this and blah, 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 blah. And I said, what have you done? Well, I've thought a lot about it. It's nothing. It means nothing. At the end of the day, the only cure for this is to do something, even if it fails, because you'll learn from it. And try, please try not to be shocked that if you do something, it actually works. I was on an elevator at a conference and a friend of mine um, was asked this great question. He ran a marketing company for lawyers. He's nationally known, fantastic. And we're on this elevator and a guy turns to him, a lawyer turns to him and goes, really, of all the advice that you just gave us, of all the different ways to grow our practice, what's the most important thing? And he looks at the guy and goes, do something, anything, just pick one, anything, do any of the things I suggested, just do one. And if that works, do another one. And then after that, do another one. But until then, just, you know, there's not a best one. Just pick one and do something. And from there, it'll grow. It'll grow. So as we start to close, and I hope, you know, I hope you heard this from the perspective that I'm a brother and sister of the bar. You know, I'm a, I'm a brethren of the bar. So, you know, we're brothers and sisters of the bar. You know, I'm, I'm passionate about this because I totally care about what you do for a living because I know what a difference lawyers make out there. I know what a difference you make. I know what sacrifices you make. But at the end of the day, you're not taking great care of yourself and great care of your practice and great care of your family consequently. So here are my key questions as we pull this together. I'm going to have somebody from my team call you, or if you can't wait, email this to us at Grow at Atticus Online and do it from the perspective that accountability is incredibly important. You won't make any change till you declare to someone that you're going to be accountable to the change. So number one, which parasite has infected your practice the worst? You know, if it's head in the sanditis, say it. 
um, what is your plan to eradicate it? You know, what are you going to do to eliminate that? And three, what is one action you can take today now? What can we do now to just move it forward? Because I know that will build momentum, but if you take an action today, it will make a huge difference. If it's bad clientitis, fire that client today. It'll make a huge difference for you, I promise. And then four, how can we help you? Where are you stuck and how can we help? So that's really what they're going to call and ask you. So when you call, give them the feedback of these four things, which infected you the worst, what's your plan to eradicate it, what's the one action you can take now, and how can we help? Now, here's my recommendation. As we pull this to a close, here's my recommendation. If your calendar, and hopefully you're looking at this on a computer screen or on your mobile device or wherever you're at, um, if your calendar looks like this, yes, I know it's a jelly bean jar, but work with me here. If it's a, if your calendar looks like this, where you're jamming everything in and your calendar is overflowing, you're not going to be able to make any change. You really aren't. This is one of the first reasons that when we start to work with a lawyer, we work with them on their time management skills, because until we get your calendar to look more like this, you're not going to be able to make much change in your practice. Jamming more into an already jammed up calendar like this, where your jelly beans are overflowing over the top of the jar, will not allow change to occur. It's not going to happen. I've been doing this long enough. I've seen enough people. You're not going to be able to make this happen. If you're trying to make change, you're going to have to make room in your life and make room in your practice to actually implement change. So here's what my recommendation is. I'm going to recommend that you do a diagnostic, and we call it a practice growth diagnostic. And it's going to give you a way of looking deeper at how you run your practice, deeper about how you think about your practice, deeper about your management skills. And it's going to give you a peek at what your firm's performance currently is like. And for some people, this is probably the most important wake-up call that you can take to really get focused on what the efforts are most important to you. And at the end of the diagnostic, you're going to look about what's the best thing to do to move your unique strength, your unique gifts forward to increase your firm's profitability. The practice growth diagnostic includes four elements, and these are fantastic elements. Number one, it's going to look at what we call the focus disk advantage, which is really you know, if you want to get the wind, is a big difference between running against the wind and having the wind at your back. The disc advantage is really a way of understanding how you personally like to see the world. And it gives you the capability of designing or redesigning your firm based on your own strengths. And we call it the focus disc advantage because it allows you to re-advantage or repurpose your firm or reorganize your firm around your strengths. Two, we're going to have you do a practice assessment. And we're really going to have you look at what we consider the solo and small firm foundations of practice growth. What's your time management skills like? What are your client development skills like? What's your team development skills like? And what's your cash flow and profitability skills like? And have you assess that. And then the person that's doing this call for you, it's going to be over the phone, takes about an hour, will give you their feedback. They're going to give you what we call the, the advisor growth analysis. And then they're going to tell you the three most important actions that they think you should take from that. Now, if you're listening to this and you're like, Steve, I'm in, I'm ready to go. I need to do this. Um, you might be saying, what's the cost? What's my investment? It's $295. And for most lawyers, this is, um, you know, less than what they're charging per hour. It includes the disk survey, the practice survey, and includes a tele an hour teleconference with the person that's trained or persons that are trained to do this. And they're really a practice growth diagnostic advisor, and they're trained to help you think through these issues. And if you're ready to go, this is how you get started. You um, go to atticusadvantage.com. You click right there on the button that says, uh, let's get started, right there where the great big yellow arrow is pointing on the let's get started. And um, from there, it'll walk you through how to schedule, how to pay, select which person you're going to do the practice growth diagnostic with. And they will send you some links. You'll take it. You'll take your disk test. You'll start your practice assessment, and you'll learn a lot. Now, let me explain one thing briefly about this. Um, you have a hundred percent money back guarantee from me on this, and from our company. 
if you take this practice growth diagnostic and you don't think it was worth the money that you've invested, um, we will refund your money, no questions asked. And this is why we always offer 100% money back guarantee. If you don't think that this was a good valuable use of your money, we'll refund the money. Um, if you don't believe the concepts, materials, and what you're learning from us is significant value, just let us know, we'll refund it. I know how hard you work for the money. We know how hard you work for the clients. We know how hard you work for your family. I do not want to be one of those people or relationships in your life where you say, well, I paid the money. It wasn't worth it. That's why we always offer 100% money back guarantee. If it's not worth it, we'll give you your money back. Um, I also have a second guarantee. My second guarantee is what I call the 90-day think about it program. So here's how this works. If you decide after listening to today's presentation that you're going to think about things and you continue to think about things, I guarantee you that if you put a date on your calendar 90 days from now, so just look at today's date, look at your calendar, write out 90 days from now and say, think about it guarantee. And just put that out on your calendar 90 days from now. And if nothing has changed in 90 days, you know that you have the same practice 90 days later from when you start to think about it. What I mean by that is that the second you start to think about something and you continue to think about something, you continue to think about that, if you make no changes, I guarantee you 100% you'll have the same practice that you did once you start to think about it. Nothing changed until you actually implement something, until you actually make a change thinking's the booby prize. So that's my second guarantee. I guarantee that all you do is think about this. You will have the same practice tomorrow that you do today. You'll have the same practice 90 days from now that you do today. And what's worse, you'll have the same practice a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, or God forbid, 10 years from now. So if you think about it, I guarantee you'll have the same practice today that you do tomorrow. Now, I've had gentlemen and ladies come up to me. In particular, one gentleman came up to me after I spoke at a conference and he said, Steve, I saw you speak two years ago at a conference and um, uh, it was me and two of my friends in that workshop and my two friends hired you. One's increased his income by five times. One took a month off and his cash flow actually improved while he's gone. Um, I haven't had any changes in my practice in two years after attending the workshop that you taught. And I said, well, what's the difference between what they did and what you did? He goes, well, they hired your company. They did the practice growth program. They took some actions. In my case, I've been thinking about it for two years. I don't know what to do with that. I didn't even know how to respond to the guy. I'm like, well, what do you think about the plan of where you're just thinking about the plan? He goes, well, I, I guess it's not particularly effective. It's not. So I'm hitting you hard on this because I know, I know, I know it's, it's a risk. It's scary. You're not so sure there's some changes, but I just want to encourage you to take action, sign up for a practice growth diagnostic, or if there's something else we can help you with, go to Atticus Advantage or send us an email at grow at Atticus Advantage. Um, and we'll do what we can to help you. I know how hard it is uh, to practice. I've done it you know, more years than I know what to do with. And I just want to encourage you to take some action to improve your practice and improve your life. Uh, with that, I'm going to pull it for a close today. First and foremost, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for what you do for your clients, because I know you're out there sacrificing time and efforts um, away from your family and away from yourself to try and make a difference for your clients. So I really appreciate that. And if there's a question or issue that you have that we didn't address today, don't hesitate to email us at grow at atticusadvantage.com. Or if you have a group or um, association that needs a speaker, don't hesitate to email us as well, grow at atticusadvantage.com. And with that, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time and attention.